Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome. It's so good to have you here. And we are thrilled to have our excellent Laura Gelfand <laughs> here as well. Before I get into all of her creds, I want to remind you that we have the Early Career and Lifetime Achievement Awards due on February 7th. So if you have an early career person or a lifetime achievement person whom you'd like to, whose resume you'd like to submit, um, please do that. Now if you'll go to our website to events and then award ceremony, that's the link for it, okay? So please think about that. And also the coffee is coming and decaf and caf, okay? <coughs> I, so when it comes, you can feel free to quietly stampede over. And the yet. champagne too, right? And the champagne is coming <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. But I, I think we're hitting the bottle or the glasses against the That's perfect. The wall to yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Laura Gelfand received a PhD in art history from Case Western and an MA from Williams and a BA from Stony Brook. Oh, I've always wanted to <laughs> be at Stony Brook. <laughs> the Berkeley of the East. It is, yeah. <laughs> And this is, these, this is Laura in her own words. My career has followed a fairly straightforward trajectory, and I was fortunate to be in the right place at the right time when the department head position at USU opened up. And I would like to say, and we were lucky that you mm -hmm. were, so thanks for being here. Laura's mother ha is a um, great icon in my field in developmental psychology. So when I heard that her daughter was coming, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's wonderful. Okay, I've been wanting to come back to Utah and this job gave me the chance to do so, so thank you for coming back. I am a widely published scholar of the history of Northern Renaissance art. My publication record reflects decades of hard work and I consider it a real accomplishment. That said, I'm also proud of having led the Department of Art and Design for nearly seven years. Working with the faculty and staff, we have hired fantastic new faculty and staff and made <coughs> significant improvements to almost every part of this large and complicated department. And I can only imagine it's, yeah, I mean, artists, yes. you know, like musicians. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to Iceland five times and can't wait to go back. Okay, so awesome. Dr. Laura. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, all of, thanks all of you for coming. Um, I'm really thrilled <coughs> to see you. I expected two people, so, and one, <laughs> and one was a prisoner, so, you know, so that's awesome. Um, this is so preliminary, okay, this is just the very beginning part of a really, really um, big, big project. So I've been working on it for a while, I've worked on little pieces, parts of it, but what I want to do is take a sort of broad look at the historic demonization of wolves, um, and it's sort of coming out of another project, so last year, I guess 2016 is when, it came out, but I published, um, I edited a volume of um, articles on um, studies of dogs, like dogs in medieval and early modern art, literature, and society. And so one of my friends wrote about wolves in that, and I started to think about wolves, and thinking about wolves in this context of living in Utah, living in a place where a lot of people would just as soon um, kill a wolf as look at it, and sort of trying to figure out what that is. Like, why is that? Where does that come from? And so it's a huge kind of amorphous project right now. It's, um, I'm sort of in the place of shifting it. And I'll be on sabbatical next year. I still don't know where. I had my Fulbright interview yesterday though. I think it went okay. So um, we'll see. But it's really, really an exciting project to me. It's not, it sort of takes me far afield. It's really interdisciplinary. It's a little scary. And I guess it's good to work on things that are scary, right? So, um, this will be kind of a quick trip. Mostly, I just want to show you kind of groovy images. But um, there, and there are not a lot of images of wolves. So I think that's another thing to just keep in mind is that there aren't that many of them. It's strange to me. There are way more dogs than wolves. Sometimes you don't know what it is when you look at it. It could be a fox, it could be a wolf, it could be a dog. Some, some of them are hard to tell. But um, I tried to only bring you wolves, although this one has a horse's ass, so <laughs> you don't really know what all is happening there, plus that face, right? Is that the best thing you've ever seen, ever? I love that thing. Is it the uh, person in back, or is it the actual body of the wolf? Well, this is, 
it's identified as a wolf and it's supposed to be wrong. No, I'm sorry, that was a joke. No, no, that is a joke. <laughs> but you can see there's a huge repair seam, so I don't know uh -huh. what happened uh -huh. here, but I think this is all way later. I don't, I don't know who would do that, um, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> um, so uh, the project, like I said, it's really at its beginnings, and so I'm kind of just showing you, I want to show you kind of a bunch of different places where wolves and women show up together, I think, um, over time or intersections of wolves with women. And then maybe at the end, we can kind of talk a bit about it and see kind of where we can, I don't know, what, what can we conclude from at least this kind of little, little run through, um, through this stuff. So I, I've really been using this a lot and I think it's a really great quote. And it comes from Barry Lopez. I bet a lot of you are at some point read Barry Lopez's book about wolves and, uh, wolves and men. But he has this quote, which I love, which is, we create wolves. In the wolf, we have not so much the animal that we have always known as one that we have consistently imagined. And I think it's really important to be thinking about that, the fact that from the time we're children, the stories we're told about wolves are almost invariably menacing, threatening, terrifying. So it's very hard to look at them in a, in a sort of with a clean slate. Um, and you, you have this really polarizing effect with wolves. There are people who love them and people who hate them. And no, not a lot of anybody in between. So again, that's anything that has that happen, I think, is a really interesting, interesting project. And so that's kind of what I'm doing. Um, so thinking about wolves and women and female wolves, so I threw in she-wolves, too, because they're they're important and they play a role here too. When they show up in stories, typically they're intended to provide a warning and often that warning is about women's sexuality and we'll see that especially when we get to um, the sort of fairy tale parts at the end. Um, also women are make great victims, so you do see that quite a bit. Um, as we go forward, you'll see, I wanted to start with Apollo because he's a really, um, wolves play a huge role with him and uh, in and out of his, of his life, and he sort of goes back and forth with them. There's no um, one, one part of his relationship with them. Wolves are associated with him, along with ravens and a whole bunch of other symbols, but you always see him there. And then you know all, Apollo has all these different faces, right? He's a sun god, he's a healing god, he's apotropaic, he's, he's all kinds of different things. Um, he can bring death with his arrows. And then he has all of these names, right? So he's a sun god, but he's also born of a wolf or born of Lycia. Those are uh, names that often are associated with him. Um, Apollo is the son of Zeus and Leto and Hera, poor Hera, um, was always so jealous of um, Leto that even though her husband had had an affair um, with Leto before they were married, it didn't matter. She was really, really mad. So she forbid her from giving birth on Earth. And so this island of Delos appeared. It was floating, supposedly it wasn't anchored anywhere. And so that's where she gave birth. And she gave birth to twins. So there's Artemis and Apollo. Um, she had Artemis first and then was in labor. You read different things, but about 11 days. Doesn't that sound fun? And, <laughs> um, and then Apollo was born and Artemis helped with Apollo's birth, but that island of Delos then also, she supposedly was taken there by wolves. And so she was surrounded by wolves when she gave birth to him. And then they make these comparisons too in terms of that they believed wolves took 11 days to have their litters. So there are all of these wolf images with him really early on. Uh, and then sometimes they say she changed into a wolf to give birth, so it's really complex. Like that one is, is really complex. And then a lot of things come from that. So Nordic myths, there are lots of ways in which people are pulling imagery from Apollo into other myths. And that wolf kind of finds its way in there. Um, Apollo himself sent she-wolves to suckle his son Miletus, uh, who was born of the daughter of Minos. Um, he also slept with Cyrene in the form of a wolf, so there, again, this wolf thing shows up quite a bit with him. Uh, the sanctuary of, at Delphi had a big bronze statue of a wolf on the altar um, that was a gift from the people of Delphi. Uh, and then he also had this other thing, which is he taught, um, Ascylus called, talks about this, but Apollo taught a group um, how to hunt and kill wolves. So there's that, which is sort of like, 
how all these things fit together, you know? Um, and Aeschylus calls him the wolf killer. So there, there's these layers with him. Um, and you see that with wolves quite a bit. It's almost like you never get one uniformly positive image of a wolf. It's almost, it's just rare to see it. Um, and it seems, I don't know, it's just a very consistent thing. The Capitoline wolf, I think she's sort of next to talk about. She's so great, okay? I've always taught this in Survey of Art History forever. Uh, and for years, it was under Etruscan, like we always taught her as an Etruscan figure. Uh, and then those twins beneath, Romulus and Remus, are uh, Renaissance. They're probably from about 1470. We think they were done by Antonio Polaiuolo, but it's not 100% sure. But she's always been, you know, to my mind, Etruscan. You always talk about all these sort of Etruscan characteristics. Uh, and now nobody thinks that. So uh, it's not. And they actually did a whole bunch of scientific work on it and found that it was cast between 1021 and 1153. So way, way, way later than everybody thought it was, uh, which is kind of interesting because we know that the Romans had loads of these wolf sculptures around, like she wolves. They're, they show up on coins. There's tons of discussions of these she-wolves, um, but none of them seem to survive. They're all melted down. So I don't know if this is, there's a lot of discussion about whether this is a copy of a Roman original, what exactly this thing is. Um, but it is this, essentially, an Ottonian image. It's been in Rome all this time, though, from what anyone can tell. Uh, and it's a... It's an interesting, I mean, it's obviously, I mean, things you can think about, right? The things you talk about with survey, right? It's obviously a female. It's obviously, you know, there's this emphasis on it as a maternal figure, although she doesn't look too friendly. But um, th there's a huge emphasis on that. And it's sort of, I always say to students, like, just don't look at those twins underneath. But the whole story of Romulus and Remus is really important, and the fact that the Romans see it as, as the beginning for them and they're using it all the time and when you walk around Rome I think all of you know you know you see it on the grates and on you know it's everywhere the symbol is everywhere a lot of cities that were incredibly dedicated to Rome like Siena use this as their motif as well as their symbol so it's a really common symbol this she-wolf uh, and she's a sort of difficult she's a difficult character as well um, it's related to the legend of the founding of Rome. I think most of you know this, but there's Romulus and Remus. Their father cast them into the Tiber River. They were rescued by a she-wolf. Um, she, it, it's supposedly they washed up on the shore. And she cared for them in her cave, which is known as the Lupercal. There are quite a few caves in Rome, um, so this is one of those. And this herdsman named Faustulus found them and raised them. And then, of course, they have various battles later on, but um, but that's sort of how the whole sort of origin story. But there are other stories that might be connected to that. So there are the um, Hirpini people who seem to be there before the ancient Romans, or maybe they turn into them. You don't quite know. And Hirpini, Hirpini is actually the Sabine word for wolf. And so there's this, the wolf seems, seems always to be embedded inside Rome somehow in a, in a sort of interesting way. Um, they also are supposed to have had a wolf lead them to Rome, to this land that they settled. And that might predate the story of Romulus and Remus. But the wolf is really embedded in Roman history. And I wanted to talk about this because I think this is so interesting. So the Lupercalian Festival, this is awesome. So the date of it? interestingly, is February 15th. Isn't that strange? Um, it's hard to think of another festival that would happen right around that date. Uh, it is a pre-Roman festival. It was, it subsumed this one called Februa, so you know the name February kind of comes from that. It started out as a spring cleansing ritual, which is kind of great. Um, and then in antiquity, it was um, thought to be connected to the ancient Greek festival from Arcadia called the Lycaea, which the name sort of tells you that was a wolf festival as well. It was dedicated to the worship of the god Pan. Um, there was apparently a statue of Pan in the Lupercal cave. Um, there are all these rituals that would happen in that cave in Rome where men would go in and they wear this sort of, it's a very strange outfit. Um, they're their own priesthood, these guys, these Lupercalia guys, um, called the Brothers of the Wolf. Have any of you ever seen that movie? Brotherhood of the Wolf, it's a really, really bad movie. Um, <laughs> but kind of 
it's a super bodice ripper. It's French. It's out of control. It's fun to watch. <laughs> um, it really is. It's, it's crazy. But um, so there are all of these associations with this cave, right, with this, this cave in the middle of Rome. Um, but the festival, actually, Plutarch describes it, and I wanted to read it to you and because it's being illustrated so well here. So many of the noble youths and the magistrates run up and down through the city naked for sport and laughter, striking those they meet with shaggy thongs. And many women of rank also purposely get in their way and like children at school present their hands to be struck, believing that the pregnant will thus be helped in delivery and the barren to pregnancy. So it is a fertility ritual, a fertility rite that happens in the middle of February. And the stuff I was reading about it, it's, it basically seems like it goes until about 500 and then they finally suppress it right around 500. And um, there's a lot of, you see people arguing about whether Valentine's Day is actually replacing it or not. It's hard to believe it isn't, but um, that's definitely um, a part of the association with this thing. And they wore wolf skins, so they would wear wolf things and they're the Brotherhood of the Wolf, and, and it all goes back to this origin, but it also involves female fertility in a pretty clear way, and it's in a very enduring, enduring festival. Um, have any of you ever been to the Lupinar? This, the, it's sort of the most famous of the houses of ill repute in Pompeii. And it's really interesting to visit, isn't it? It's, like, it's crazy, right? It's, crazy. it's full of graffiti, and um, the guides are always like, oh, do you want to see the dirty pictures? You know? And it's got tons <laughs> of paintings of people having sex all over the walls. Because it's, you know, it's a house of prostitution. Women, Roman women who were prostitutes, were called lupa. They were she-wolves. And then, so it's like, how do you think about that, right? How does that work if the founding mother is a she-wolf and then you've got she-wolves as prostitutes? Like, what does that mean, you know? I think there's a, some interesting, it's interesting to think about that, you know? What, how did, what did they make of that? And I don't really know. I mean, it's just one of those things I'm kind of, I want to sort of throw out there um, for you to sort of think about in a way. So if you haven't been there, it's definitely worth checking that out. It's, it's crazy. Um, saints, the first part of this project actually started with me working on saints. They're mostly male saints that are associated with wolves, but there actually are quite a few female saints. Um, Saint Clair is a kind of, she's great. So Saint Clair is actually Francis's, Saint Francis's little sister. Francis has a really famous story with a wolf. It's the Wolf of Gubbio. And um, the Wolf of Gubbio was kind of out of control. It was eating people a lot. <laughs> and you know, don't really want them to do that. And so Francis, <coughs> you know, Francis is like nature boy, right? So Francis goes and um, talks to the wolf. And I love this because it's so different from all the other ones. He talks to the wolf and says, what's the, you know, what's the problem? Like, like, why are you doing this? And the wolf basically explains to him, you know, I'm really, really hungry. There's nothing, there's nothing for me to eat. So he makes a deal with this wolf, and there are these really fabulous images of Francis shaking this wolf's paw, and they actually make a legal agreement. So uh, he shakes his, you know, on it and says, look, the people in the town of Gubbio will feed you. They'll take care of you. And then you just have to agree not to eat them anymore. <laughs> and the wolf's like, sounds cool, you know? So they, they shake, and then they walk into town together. And there are these really great images where you've got like someone writing down the legal agreement, and they're shaking hands. And, and it's so Francis, right? No other saint does this, you know? And then the wolf, when it dies, it's, um, it's really, it lives there for about two years, and then it, it finally dies. And there are like, recent excavations, they actually found like a, a big wolf, sort of remains of a big wolf in the cathedral in Gubbio. So it seems like it's based on something, who knows? Um, but not to be outdone, St. Clair has her own wolf story. And they live in the same town. They're both from Assisi. And she's the female, sort of female version of Francis. Uh, her wolf-related miracle shows up in the Golden Legend. It's a really nice one. So there's this story of a fearsome wolf who had already stolen and eaten one of this woman's children. So it's the same woman this happens to. And it came back and snatched her, her like another sibling, just like took it. Um, by the head and <laughs> ran off into the forest. And the child's mother pursued the wolf to the edge of the woods and was like screaming and crying. And people from the town came out um, and she started pleading with St. Clair to save her child. 
And these neighbors emerged from their home and they ran into the woods and they found her child. And he was hurt, but he was actually okay. And so that's this miracle. And the thing that keeps puzzling me about this is why Giovanni Di Paolo did something so totally different. I mean, it's like, it doesn't show that at all. Um, I mean, you've got St. Clair, you've got this lady. I mean, I guess it's sort of the edge, but you don't have any of the other people. <coughs> and it's, the wolf is dead, which you, is not part of the story. And it's got an arm. And I mean, it's so different. And I keep thinking at some point I'm going to work on that because it's a totally different thing that's being shown than the story. And there's nothing else in the golden legend like it. So I think there's probably something interesting happening there, whether there was something locally that was exactly this thing that happened. And he's showing that instead. And people would have known. I don't really know. But um, I think it's a sort of interesting thing. And this is one of the things you see a lot, is these children being grabbed. And they do, that does seem to, if you start looking for actual data for how many people are killed by wolves, there aren't a whole lot of wolves. But um, there are a few studies that have been done about France and sort of the numbers, and the numbers vary dramatically. It's hard to know what to believe and what not to believe. Um, but it, it does seem like children are, are likelier targets, especially if they're out there by themselves. They're little. I mean, it kind of makes sense. But everything I'm reading seems to indicate wolves really, unless they're absolutely starving, are not interested in people at all. You know, that is not what they're after. So um, I think that's it's something to just sort of know, Laura, think about. Yeah. Before you change yeah. that, so is the dead wolf the same wolf as the one with the arm? Yeah. Definitely. So it's kind of like a, a little cartoon story. Yeah, they love doing that. Like, this is exactly the time period where you see that continuous narrative, is mm -hmm. what it's called. So where you'll see the same thing happening twice. It's fun to look at. It mm -hmm. is like a cartoon. Yeah. Look at that landscape. Is that good? Yeah. I know. I love that. So these Sienese painters are fantastic. St. Blaise, I love these. OK. So St. Blaise was being taken to prison. And he met an old widow whose only possession, a pig, had been taken by a wolf. So Blaze consoled her and ordered the wolf to return the pig unharmed. Uh, and it did. And so the widow um, brought him candles to light his cell while he was in prison. That was gratitude. So there's a sort of light connection there, which is interesting. But the pictures are always really great with this wolf sort of bringing back this pig, you know, like, here's your pig lady. Um, and I just, I love them. So there's one, which is pretty great. And here's the second one. I'm sorry, this is like not a very high quality image. But that wolf is so funny, you know, like, oh, there's, there's, your, there's your pig, you know. <laughs> it's so great. And she's really happy. And you know, I just everything about this is fantastic. But the thing that I was finding with the saints is that they temporarily alter wolf behavior. They, it's only Francis who I think completely converts and changes a wolf. And I always think of what it seems to be is the wolf is the absolute ultimate unrepentant sinner. And if you can convert the wolf, you know, you're really, really powerful. That's a great miracle. And that seems to be what it is. Is that sort of what, you're, what you find um, more than, more than other, other places? Lots of, lots of kids being eaten. So here you go. Um, this is actually related to Aesop's fable. And um, there are lots and lots of these um, Aesop's stories that have wolves. Only one is with a woman. Um, a wolf was hunting up and down for his supper. He passed by the door of a house where a little child was crying loudly. Hold your tongue, said the nurse to the child, or I'll throw you to the wolf. The wolf, hearing this, waited near the house, expecting she would keep her word. The nurse, however, when the child was quiet, changed her tone and said, if the naughty wolf comes now, we'll beat his brains out for him. The wolf thought it was high time to be off and went away grumbling at the folly, at his folly of putting faith in the words of a woman. <laughs> so that's the lesson. <laughs> All y'all. Um, <laughs> really, and there are different interpretations for it. There are a lot of variations on this story, but that was the one I thought was so aggravating um, and really, really interesting. And so you see, this is actually one of these saints, though. Um, that's showing like the return of an, I, and I can't find anything about him, which is a funny one, he's from Augsburg, but it shows sort of this return, um, return there. And 
let me give you this one because this is really the Aesop's fable and I love this because this artist only he's like I'm going to show a nurse and a child and it's really a virgin and child image like it's not a nurse inside a house it's a completely different thing um, and I like that wolf quite a bit too but it's so funny that you would I mean it makes sense that's what he's got as a model and so that's what he's going to copy but they're really really strange um, these and Aesop's fables I think I mean, Jeannie knows more about this than I do, so. But um, but they're they're a really great sort of resource for um, then figuring out what's happening with fairy tales and all the other stories that are going on. And so I'm just going to kind of talk about Red Riding Hood quickly. And I really love these images. So um, it's much much later, so we're going really late. Um, but the French version of this is so good. It's such an interesting version of Red Riding Hood. And I now know, thanks to Lynn, that it's tail type 333. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it feels so smart. Um, they know, I guess the most recent research is showing that the story, this Red Riding Hood story, actually originated in Europe in the first century. It's really, really, really old. And you can see what it's probably related to. Um, Grimm's and Perrault, these are the Perrault uh, illustrations for Perrault, uh, are the best known versions. Um, Pejo is about 1679, just so you have a sense of time. Um, and the story, it's familiar, but I'm just going to go through it because it's probably been a while for a lot of you. Um, a big bad wolf wants to eat the girl and the food in her basket, and he secretly stalks her behind the trees. He's like hiding behind her, and then he approaches her, and she naively tells him where she's going, and that's a big part of the problem, telling a stranger where you're going. He suggests that she pick some flowers for her grandmother, which she does, and in the meantime, he goes to the grandmother's house, gains entry by pretending to be her. There's a lot of cross-dressing going on. Um, swallows the grandmother whole. Um, sometimes he locks her in a closet. And then he waits for her, uh, waits for Red Riding Hood, disguised as the grandma. When the girl arrives, she notices that her grandmother looks very strange. Um, she says, what a deep voice you have the better to greet you with, says the wolf. Goodness, what big eyes you have. The better to see you with, responds the wolf. What big hands you have. The better to hug or grab you with, says the wolf. And lastly, what a big mouth you have. The better to eat you with, responds the wolf, at which point he jumps out of bed and eats her up too, and then he falls asleep. So in Perrault's version of the story, which is the very first one published, the tale actually ends there. No huntsman comes and gets, you know, she's dead. Everybody's dead. It's, it's not that fun. Um, you don't have the wolf cut up. You don't torture the wolf, nothing. Um, and Perrault writes and says, he warns girls against the big bad wolf and says, but alas for those who do not know that of all wolves, the docile ones are those who are most dangerous. So it's really, um, it's, it's something that's supposed to scare girls primarily into behaving more safely, into watching themselves and being careful about themselves. Uh, there are a whole bunch of, of strange, strange variations on it. Uh, often, I mean, like in Perrault, you see her get into the bed with the wolf, which I, there's a highly sexualized version of it. The French version is way more sexual than all the other ones. Uh, and I just, I can't even stand how much I love these illustrations. They're so, so good. Um, so I wanted to bring them in. I think that wolf in that cap is just really, really fantastic. Um, there are a whole bunch of things that are related in this story to classical antiquity, to sort of classical antique stories. Um, there's a story by Pausanias that this may be related to, where a virgin girl was offered to a malevolent spirit who is dressed as a wolf every year. Uh, so it's possible that that's related to that. Um, then this boxer shows up and, and marries her. Um, there are a lot of other stories, Greek authors, um, the, the Pyrrhic, there are Pyrrhic stories, Pyrrhic, Pyrrhic women that are actually related to this too. Um, and I wanted to go through a few different interpretations for Red Riding Hood. So um, folklorists, cultural anthropologists, some have seen it in terms of solar myths, which brings us back to Apollo. Um, so solar myths and other naturally occurring cycles, like it can be related to that. The red hood represents the bright sun, which is ultimately followed by the terrible night, which is the wolf, and variations um, in which she cuts, she's cut out of the wolf belly 
uh, represents dawn. So there's you know a possibility that in, in various forms it represents that, um, and it ties into Norse mythology as well. So you can kind of the wolf is this sort of exists on a continuum. It it is the symbol. It's not a real thing, right? It's a symbol that's kind of weaving between all these cultures in this really strangely symbolic way. Um, I'm going to show one more thing, and then I really do want to talk with everybody about these things. I had to show this because this is so unbelievable. So do you all remember when this came out? It was like 1991 when this book came out. Um, it was a Jungian counterpart to the Iron John movement. Um, and I have not read it. But I did read this review, which I thought was really fun, and I was going to share it with you. You ready? <laughs> the author provides few concrete examples that might help women understand what she expects them to do. And her prose abounds in generalizations and oddities. Quote, the ambitious woman who is heartfelt toward her accomplishments, end quote, that further undermine her credibility and her considerable scholarship, oratory, ecstatic, and ultimately irritating. <laughs> so I thought that would be so <coughs> fun to end with except this, which is so good and really recent. Can you all read it? <laughs> it's the best thing ever. So I wanted to talk to all of you and see because, you know, if any of you have worked on wolves, if you other, have other wolf stories, if you have other ideas about them. I mean, this is such a big, wide-ranging project, and it kind of goes, it can go anywhere. And it is really the beginning. And if you want to grab coffee and then talk, we can do that too. But I wanted to kind of sort of get your take on this and ask what you think and all of that. Let's discuss. Well, I feel like people, there's no middle ground with wolves mm -hmm. today. Like, we either love them and are like, they should be taken care of right. and they're these beautiful animals are we need to hunt all of them mm -hmm. and why were they reintroduced anywhere right I mean is that true throughout history that kind of like you either love them or hate them or it's just you hate them the love is totally I don't amazing. really think I haven't found any cultures that really love them uh -huh. um, but I think they're not as as cities grow uh -huh. as the human population grows and they start to move into wolf territory that's when you find those conflicts showing mm -hmm. up and it's all about sort of those liminal spaces right mm -hmm. and pushing them out as far out as you can get them I think I mean there are places in Europe where they survived uh -huh. and, and in some greater numbers they seem more positive towards them in Italy than anywhere else that I can see um, or at least that I found so far and there's all this rewilding like stuff this. yeah they do you're right yeah, Norway doesn't. <laughs> Not at all. I think you're um, actually still allowed to hunt wolves in Poland, like wealthy, wealthy European hunters, where it's like banned in other places right. in Europe. Poland's sort of like the Poland. dark. Yeah, it's sort of like the dark wilderness of Europe, but because they still have wolves. And yeah, you know, it's like a staff. You know, that's like, that's nice. Well, there's all these calls. They've been because they're spreading right now naturally, mm -hmm. so they've been approving them. The French just a, approved a call of 40 wolves, which is over 20% of the population, as far as they know. Um, the Norwegians just did another call. They seem to do them pretty regularly. And I mean, when, I, when I was in Norway, I know it's just my experience, I didn't even see a squirrel. I was like, there was nothing living there. And it was just <laughs> like, I don't know where these wolves are, I don't, you know, but it's like, uh, it's weird. Um, so, but the French, they were protected for a long, long time, as long as there weren't any. There were none, you know? And as soon as they came over from Italy, then it was like, oh, let's try and get rid of them. Um, England has got this huge rewilding movement going right now. Mm -hmm. So they tried to, they did bring the lynx back this uh -huh. year. And there's really a push to bring the wolf back. And then of course, like a counter push, you know? So it'll be interesting to see what happens. They have been gone from England, probably from the mid 14th century. They've been gone a really long time. Oh, yeah. So foxes and badgers are the biggest things there. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Um, Scotland, when they got rid of theirs, they actually systematically burned their forests to get rid of them. So it's it's wild. Um, so it's a really it's an interesting problem, you know. I think where it gets to me, I'm not going to go this late because it bother, it really bothers me. But in America, it's where you really see the industrialization of murdering them, you know, uh -huh. of getting rid of them because yeah. they get the firepower and everything just. It gets so exponential at yeah. that point that I just find it super depressing. Yeah. You know? So, yeah.
And right now there's stuff happening too. Colorado's trying to allow just regular hunting. Or okay. If you see in Idaho, you can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Idaho, the poll end of them. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> So, so someone has to bring up the pop culture yeah. reference to uh, you, you, you um, Brotherhood of the Wolf, but just the werewolf and mm-hmm. also the kind of contemporary marketing of werewolves to young girls. Yeah, right, through Twilight, just see. No, I was I was the mother of three tweens during that epic, and uh-huh. so so it was really fascinating to me to sort of see what that was yeah. about. I just wonder if that... So how did they... I mean, was it just about looks, or was it something else? I feel like it's a whole genre mm-hmm. of, um, basically, if you're a young girl and you're attracted to a boy, if you get too close to this boy, he will kill you, uh, right? Because he will morph into, like, a zombie. It's the same or, as Red like, right? Yeah, right? But, exactly. But, but, but it's a, like, it thought this was such a contemporary yeah. reworking of this. Yeah. Um, but there's something also titillating about it. It's like, it's all, it's all like, foreplay for 12-year-olds. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't find I'm werewolves so, anywhere so. near as... <laughs> Sexy or attractive as vampires? I don't know. You know? I mean, I know people do, but Sorry. as characters. Like the are second class to the vampires. Yeah, right? It's weird, right? <laughs> it's I'm thinking, you know, I mean, I don't know that ancient uh, material at all, but it really struck me. That I didn't get a sense of hatred of wolves from the just ancient. The, yeah, the you Roman, know, yeah. There was much more of a, like an affiliation, like these are our founding. Right. Like we are wolves and wolves are us, you know, so we're being, um, you know, they feed us, mm-hmm. our gods transform into them, we have sex with them. I mean, it, it kind of actually, a lot of that made sense, even the, the prostitutes as being wolves, because it was it was all about we are wolves and wolves are us, and it seems like right. there's a lot of intermingling and shape, not, not formal shape shifting, but you know, like symbolic mm-hmm. shape shifting back and forth. And I kind of wonder maybe the, the hatred of it just came much later. Well, and, and that may, it, it might. I mean, I, I need to sort of sort through it because it's still all really new to me. I, I mean, I agree that it, it seems way more positive. It's, but the Roman stuff in particular yeah, yeah. is like, way like, more positive. Our gods are wolves and they sleep with humans right. in form and then we're nurtured by them. And, but I mean, you know, when it goes... Rome is what they would have considered Rome like the, the beginning of humanity, essentially. Yeah, you know, like but I mean, the Greeks, the Greeks have them though, right? I mean, Apollo's... Greek, and so you know they're talking about them in a in a somewhat more positive way. But there are some definitely negative pieces in there. Um, the Romans are the most positive, I think. But when it goes anywhere else, it changes. So, like the Nordic wolves are very very scary. You know, um, I mean the whole world ends in the jaws. I mean Ragnarok ends in the jaws of a wolf. You know, a wolf eats the whole world. So, I mean that's scary. You know? <laughs> So when that, I mean, and I think that probably originates with the classical myths and then all, it just changes significantly when it goes there. But um, they're much more frightening in other places, it's true. And I, and I think that I would like to think it's related to then having a po- more positive attitude towards wolves in Italy than almost anywhere else in Europe. And they still seem to. It's, you don't ever see the same things happening there. Um, and I don't know. I don't, it's hard to know if you can make that argument or not. You know? So, yeah. Yeah. Two footnotes and then a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, piggybacking on the earlier contributions, I think Harry Potter and how Ron reinscribes the, the, the wolf in not just in, in, as an ally, mm-hmm. but against the bad potential. Um, and uh, Ron is known as one of the stars. So the place that I know that kind of showing up first is that story of Isengrimus. So, and that's, to me, at least that's the first place I found it. Uh, and then, so Isen, you know, Isengrim is this, is a wolf. It's the main <coughs> character, and he's total asshole. I love him. He's um, a monk, 
So he's a monk wolf, and he's he's unbelievable. He's really bad, and he says all kinds of things. Like he he's completely out of control. He drinks all the wine in the entire monastery, you know, and says, "Well, my my unbelievable greed is what qualifies me. I should actually be the abbot," you know. I mean, he's just really. It's a total critique. Like they use this wolf and his sort of negative and sort of cocky behavior as a critique of of the clergy. But then the next one is Renard the Fox. And, and in that, the wolf is actually even has the same name. It's Isengrim. But there, the fox always tricks that wolf, always. And the wolf is sort of a stupid character. And it, that seems much more like sort of Looney Tunes and, and all of that. Every once in a while, that wolf is a little, a little bit more clever. But it's never a very impressive animal. Um, it's the fox that's really smart there. And so I don't know, I haven't sort of figured out how it all moves out of that. Uh, those are so widespread, they're so popular. Um, that I, I, and I haven't sort of managed to pull all those pieces together yet. It's a, but yeah, it's really interesting, you know. Um, and using him, and then, you know, in terms of the Nazi soldiers, you know, they're really associated, like Mars, Mars has wolves, right, the god of war. Um, and they're associated with Thor, um, so they are really there's a war aspect to wolves often. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's scary. It's a scary thing, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. Thanks. No. That and it gives me. It's. Yeah. That's something to think. So building off of both of those, the, the wolf as the trickster and the tricked reminds me also of late medieval and very early, early modern um, English folklore where the devil is the both trickster mm. and the trick. Yeah. And so I wonder if there's some connection there. And then yeah. also because the, in the, from the high medieval through, you know, I'm sure this ebbs and flows of it between kind of Bernard and Claire, of Clairvaux and the early 17th century, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but starting, I think, with Clairvaux, we see uh, uh, foxes talked about as heretics who spoil the vineyard of the true faith. Right, right. And so if I wonder if, if there are these kind of mm. stories or allegories of foxes tricking wolves, if there could be a, some sort of connection right. with like a heretic or an atheist or an unbeliever right. could even fool the devil. So like the fox is actually more dangerous yeah. than the wolf. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. this is like, yeah, no. these are just kind of thoughts. No, no, it's, no, it's good. I mean, all it's Christianity sure does seem to hate wolves more than Romans. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, because they, they become a really, a, a metaphor that's used all the time. You know, wolf in sheep's clothing all yeah. the time, all the time. Well, and I also, I I was thinking through your presentation, and I can't shake this, so I'm just going to throw it out to you. Um, but I didn't, I didn't want to bring it up because it's about a dog. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> but uh, you it know, I'm always like happy to talk about dogs. I was like, well, you know, we've closed the book on dogs. So, but the the legend of Saint Winifred. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the, great, isn't it? Yeah, as this kind of dog protector, but of course, it's not a protector. It's like th these parents are effectively putting their children out in the woods to be eaten by wild dogs and wolves. Yeah. And telling themselves that that they're being carried off by some saint dog right. to be protected because the family can't provide for them. Right. But there, so I just keep thinking there has to be some kind of link between Saint Winifred and wolves. Yeah. But I don't know what it is, so I'll just let you solve that. Well, no, I think, but I think you're right, and I think Guinefor is really is kind of great because that reminds me so much of Red Riding Hood that story oh, yeah. always, right? Yeah. So do you all know the Guinefor one? It's so great. There's a really great book about this. Um, Oh, it's the, Holy a, the Holy Greyhound. So, and it is a really similar story. So, um, this huntsman leaves his child in the care of his greyhound, and he goes off and goes to work, and a huge snake comes in to the wherever I think it was like, <coughs> in a crappy cabin, and the greyhound sees it and kills it. Right, there's this bloody battle, and so when the huntsman comes in, all he sees is the dog and blood everywhere. And he assumes that the dog killed the child, and so he kills the dog. 
and the dog becomes this martyr. It's this martyr saint, Guinefort, and then there's a well, this really famous well that becomes sacred to Guinefort, and it's like the only dog saint, but um, it's a really weird story. And then the well goes on and on as a really sort of popular spot to, I mean, a lot of things happen, but leaving children there is a huge part of it, so. Yeah, in baskets yeah. lit by candles so that the saint dog can find the child. And of course, my modern brain's like, no, you're going to burn the child up. Yeah. Because candles will burn the rushes. Yeah. And of course, if it doesn't burn, then, you know, the wolves will come get it. Right. It's really awful. But then when parents go back and, and look and, oh, look, the basket's empty. Oh, good, my child was carried off by the saint dog. Seems good. And, yeah, and, right. Um, it's a pretty weird, it's weird. You're right, though. I wonder how many seems, were there, wild. There must be some connective tissue between yeah. that kind of folklore and wolf-related yeah. folklore. Yeah. I wonder, though, if it's wolves or wild dogs, too, because there's, mm -hmm. you know, there would have been plenty of those around, too. Jeannie. Yeah, I'm sure you know there are contemporary urban legends that are based off of them, like do with that story just retold. Like what? Like, like, <laughs> um, oh, probably in the 90s, Young Brinzot, he's got a collection Okay. I'll send you the link. But it's basically the same story. Yeah. Same story. Um, so occasionally, I, I, whenever I teach my grinder, which has been a while now, I dip into the wolf. You know, how dangerous really are they? And I read <clears throat> various things, and I haven't read anything for several years now, but like, okay, they're, the wolves really are going to attack humans. And then, well, the wolves in Europe then were different, so they might have really attacked humans. Or then there are some rare humans, we think the wolves on like Isle Royale mm -hmm. might attack humans. And then I do know that there was a case a few years ago on Cape Breton Island where a wolf did attack and kill a woman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was chased by wolves. You were? So you've had bad luck out in nature. I do. Either that or it was a wild dog. Well, and then, then you know what I did was actually, um, a, don't go anywhere with this, but a folk musician. And she had her earbuds in. She got. Oh. And I think there was more than one of them, but it seems weird to me at the time. Yeah. But I couldn't, I couldn't find any real media interpretation, so I was in Cape Breton last summer. This was a few years mm -hmm. ago now. I asked, I asked a friend. I said, you know, I remember this story. Did, has anything ever come out about that? He said, well, they think it was wolf dog hybrid. Yeah. So, do you have any sense of what the danger really is? Because I've never been able. To find well, it's that. weird because it's all over the place. Because you're right. It's like nothing there's no danger or there's this guy in France and I keep running into him and I actually asked you know I brought Alex Pluskowski in and so I asked him so I'm like this guy should know right he's like the wolf guy um he seemed to feel like the French guy's data was okay but I just thought how could he possibly know that you can go through there's a site and I can even send it to you and he lists it's like 60,000 deaths over the course of several hundred it's a huge number mm -hmm. it almost seemed like the sort of witch craze to me it was really yeah, weird how really big it was like you know, and, and even sort of had, for some reason, he was able to break it down into rabid wolves and non-rabid wolves. I'm like, how could you possibly know this? <laughs> you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. The number of dogs that are there all have to, how would you know the difference right. in some cases? Well, and Dan McNulty, the wolf guy on campus, told me that whenever you see a black wolf, that's actually, it has some dog in it. It's not a wolf wolf. And so any black wolf has some dog in it, way back, way back. And he was saying he thought that if people knew that, maybe they would treat wolves a little differently, you know, that if people think they have some dog, they're a little bit more positive towards them, um, which I don't know, you know. But if you go to the sanctuaries, I mean, Andrew and I went to two wolf sanctuaries last year, and they, they Mission Wolf, they're both in Col near Colorado Springs, so Mission Wolf, and then, Andrew, what was the other one called? I follow them. And I Wolf. Yeah, it was like Colorado. Colorado Wolf Center, wolf maybe? I've, I've, I've seen the wolf from one of the Colorado ones, and I've been to one for Wolf Sanctuary in Indiana. Yeah. And I think they must, uh, my guess is they're all quite different from one another, but because these had very different ways in which they fulfilled their mission, you know, and they would tell the narrative of, this, of wolves. And But in all, they sort of said they're not, they don't want to be with people. Yeah. They don't want to be around people. But then if you've been persecuted for thousands of years maybe you wouldn't want to be around. <laughs> so I don't know, right? I mean it doesn't seem like they would want to unless they, they were desperate. They 
Well, and if we're putting... They're not studied. People don't study them. But if we're putting this data together, how many people are killed by, like, moose? Like, I, I just yes. wonder. Like, yes. and they don't get vilified this way. And deer, they always say deer, deer is deer. huge. Yeah. Yeah. So I just... Yeah. Yeah, it's weird, right? I mean, they get... The sh they just get demonized all they're always at fault they're always at, it's weird right and you look at those numbers and there's so few of them mm -hmm. there's just so few of them and it's like they really want to eradicate all of them so i apologize to all the about biologists in the room <laughs> don't they come from the same evolutionary root as dogs yes yeah. and, and then they and separated then. a long 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 mm -hmm. time ago okay so when so. and we seem to have been we domesticated dog okay but I always think or the and then there's some that say the dog domesticated itself but um, <laughs> it's the ones that could tolerate us realized it was worthwhile to be near us that was probably prehistory I guess is there I think now they're saying between I think it it's funny I must have read this a thousand times when I did that book um, I think between 10 and 20 thousand years ago it's a long time ago mm -hmm. they're way way earlier than you think you know and I always feel so bad for the wolves. I feel like they made the bad decision. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking how unfortunate it is mm -hmm. that we don't have evidence, you know, of how wolves were loved so much that they. Mm -hmm. I know. See, I'm, I'm going know. from the human side. That humans domesticated some of them, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, wolves became bad. Well, and, and they use. There are these sort of fables where the dog and the wolf have these interactions with each mm -hmm. other. And they're really funny. There's a really nice one where the, the wolf and the dog run into each other and they're walking together and just talking about their lives. And the, As you do. Yes, you do. As you do. <laughs> and the wolf, um, the wolf looks at the dog and notices that he's got like this sort of, he doesn't have a collar, but there's marks from where he had a collar on his neck. And he says, what is that? And he says, oh, at home I have to wear this thing. And the wolf's like, Phew. I'm out. I would never do that. And he's like, nothing is worth giving up your freedom. Mm -hmm. And I like, I like that story. The wolf is really, I think, sort of fabulous in that story. Um, and it seems like an unusual story in a way. Um, I wish there were more sort of like that because typically the wolf is just like embodies gl like gluttony, greed. Mm -hmm. There's all this stuff about they think that wolves kill for fun, which nothing seems to show that. Yeah, um, but yeah they're just given every. Every negative connotation you can get. Mm -hmm. And you. So, if like in your in your research, um, so wolves are the wild ancestor or whatever of dogs. Dogs we always have around us. Um, we think we can predict their their behavior and, and train them, but wolves are a total wild card. Have you seen any other? Um, across any interest in big cats because we have domesticated yeah. cats, but we don't really control cats. Cats do whatever they want yeah. to put up with us. Yeah. But their wild and biggest things are, you know, like the lions. And they're more, tiger. yeah, more dangerous. How are they represented in our... Uh, you know, because I haven't specifically looked at them, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know, but you don't see them nearly as often. Mm -hmm. They're not represented nearly as often. I don't know about folklore if you find the same thing, that cats are not as present. Mm -hmm. okay. Impressionistically. Yeah. I mean, there are all the stuff with cats and witches, but I mean, I really think it has to do, you know, there's something about that whole agrarian thing and the wolf and the sheep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? so yeah. It's all about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Ultimately, I think, whereas the big cats, yeah, they can pick them off, but that's sure. not as common. Right. Whereas when you're competing with these guys, and hey, when you're, you know, team leader, Jesus is symbolized as a lamb. Yeah, right. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, do cats not work in packs either. I mean, that's mm -mm. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. Would that vary geographically? Like, would there be more just, stories in Africa? I was just wondering. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. Well, I was like, there's not lions in right, Europe anyway. Right. So, so, yeah. Yeah. so is it like it's the most dangerous thing mm -hmm. out there? Mm -hmm. Right. So that's... Yeah. Yeah. But you don't see it with bears. Like, bears are also problematic with humans, but um, we don't have domesticated mm -hmm. bears hanging out with us, mm -hmm. so they're kind of like wild, but on their own. There, I think they really, I mean, you see illustrations of them, you know, in the margins of, of manuscripts, mm -hmm. but I don't, they're, they're, to me, quite uncommon. I don't know of any, like, bears and saints, I don't know, like, there are not a lot of bear. But you don't have <laughs> a teddy wolf, right? Yeah. You don't have, like, the Winnie the Pooh, right? The way that 
you know, you do, the childhood version of the bear is like mm-hmm. super friendly and yeah. cuddly so and, cute, right? Yeah. Right? and like the actual yeah. bear is nothing like. No, not at all. Um, right? And there's no yeah. equivalent of wolves Mm-mm. like that. No. Right? They're no. just scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not supposed to. Well, I wonder, this is probably dumb, but I wonder if there's something to that, the socialization of bears, like, because they run in packs and we run in packs for survival yeah. and some parallels there. Hmm. And then we see things mirrored back that we don't like. I don't know. It's funny because the wolves do have like some of their behaviors. When you really read about them, they're like they're the ideal behaviors, mm-hmm. right? They're like really oriented towards family and mm-hmm. children, and they seem to have they you know they form these really loving relationships, and you know they're they're pretty wonderful. I mean, they seem like in terms of their interactions with each other, they sort of evince kind of the best. Although then they also eat the older ones, mm-hmm. which isn't that nice. <laughs> but um, you know. but it's um. I don't know. I think sometimes there is that. They sort of are a reflection of us mm-hmm. in a different way. And, and, I, and I do think having dogs as a mirror, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I've been thinking about is this a rejection? Do you have this sense of rejection that the wolves are rejecting us? <laughs> you know, the dogs came and sat with us, but the wolves reject us. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know how you would ever prove that, but in some ways I think maybe it's, it's somewhere in there, you know, because mm-hmm. they're so impressive as animals. So, oh my gosh, it's almost one. Any, anything else? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Anybody? Just, yeah. Go ahead, Susan. The, the kind of tickling my brain. The, the mother and child where the Virgin Mary is portrayed in pink. Yeah. Um, maybe this is just I've been teaching Western Civ too much. But the, the wolf there is in a similar position to how Amit is often portrayed in Egyptian representations of Amit. You know, hmm. The combination of yeah. the crocodile, ah. the hippopotamus, and the lion. And the, like when that slide came up, I thought, that's Amit. Really? But, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Because, like, like, weighing the purity of Christ or Mary. Or, yeah. You know, because Ahmed's job is to is to wait there to devour the, the heart of anyone who doesn't quite literally measure up. So I, I don't know yeah. if, that's, if, if I'm just completely in outer space. But, but yeah, the, the uh, second that came up, I that's was like, interesting. that's Ahmed. Oh, that's really interesting. Huh. So I, I, I just, you know, I wonder where where that was produced, if there could be some sort of leftovers of that coming in, or if, or if it just is coincidence. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's, some, it's definitely something to think about. Yeah. So thanks. Thank you. Thanks, all of you. Thanks for your ideas and all of it. And thank you. Thanks, Anne.